Hello and welcome everybody to this series on color spaces and color management. Since you're watching this video, you've probably already encountered color spaces in the past. And after doing some research, you might have found yourself even more confused than to begin with. While color spaces are, without any doubt, a very complicated topic, I believe that a large part of the confusion is attributed to the huge amount of misleading or contradicting information. A lot of the content regarding this topic either skips the basics and is thus too complicated for beginners, or too basic and incomplete to truly teach you anything. And while this video will be quite technical, due to the nature of the subject, I'm aiming to include all the necessary background information for anybody to follow along. Originally, this video series was intended to be published as an article, but after some issues with character limitations, I've decided to make this video instead. Before we're getting started, I want to make two disclaimers. Disclaimer number one, keep in mind that I wrote the script for this video at the beginning of 2021, and any comments regarding compatibility are based on this date, and any specific values mentioned in regards to ACES are based on ACES 1.1. Disclaimer number two, this video is created by me, a visual effects artist working in the movie industry. Furthermore, I'm currently employed as a texture artist. And while I do know a thing or two about other disciplines, my job will, without any doubt, have an impact on my perspective on this topic. Other industries, such as the gaming industry, might set different priorities. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's get started. What are color spaces? Well, color spaces determine how your PC interprets the raw numbers stored in an image file. It's similar to how a language defines the meaning of a word. Imagine you found a bottle, which is labeled with the word gift. If the label was written in English, you should be fine to drink it, but if it was written in German instead, you'd better stay far away from it, as the German word gift translates to poison. Without knowing the color space of an image file, your PC has to assume how to translate the data which is given to it. Similarly to how the same word can have two different meanings depending on the language, the same set of values can correspond to multiple different colors, depending on the color space. The image you can see right now has been encoded using the sRGB color space, while the images surrounding it demonstrate what it might look like if your PC assumed the wrong color space when decoding the image. But why do we even need multiple color spaces? The benefit of having more than one color space is that we can optimize our data for a specific use case. The best example I can think of is printing. Printers use a different set of colors than computer displays. The reason for this is that the two mediums don't share the same properties. The nature of screens is additive, while printing is subtractive. Or in other words, printing removes light in relation to the white color of the paper. Both screens and printing need to be optimized for our color vision. Our eyes only have three kinds of color receptors, and while each receptor is sensitive to a range of wavelengths, we can simplify our color vision based on the three colors which we perceive the strongest – red, green, and blue. Both screens and printers aim to control these three colors individually. Screens are additive and simply add red, green, or blue light. Printers, on the other hand, subtract these colors by adding their complementary colors. If we want to subtract red, we need cyan. If we want to subtract green, we need magenta. And if we want to subtract blue, we need yellow. In order to reach very dark values, printers need to use black as an additional primary. This primary is also known as key. This leaves us with the primary colors we are used to. RGB for screens and CMYK for printing. This shift in the primary colors alone would already justify the existence of multiple color spaces, but there's more. For example, the range of colors, a nonlinear brightness response, or white balance. What defines a color space? There are two properties defining a color space the gamut and the transfer function, which is commonly referred to as gamma. These terms typically cause a lot of confusion whenever they are brought up, so let's break each of them down individually. In simple words, the term gamut refers to a fixed range or set of colors available to you within a specific color space. 
while the transfer function, or gamma, defines the relative brightness of the stored values. Technically, the term gamma refers to a specific type of transfer function, but many people treat these two terms as interchangeable anyway. The separation into color and brightness is only a simplification though, and we will need to take a closer look to truly understand the consequences. Let's start with the transfer function. As I mentioned before, the transfer function defines the brightness curve and thus the relative brightness of the values stored in an image file. Old CRT monitors did not have a linear response to the input signal. Doubling the input voltage did not double the brightness of the output. This led to dark values being displayed too dark in relation to their bright counterparts. Displaying this image on a CRT monitor without any corrections would have approximately looked like this. This is where transfer functions came into play, as they allowed us to lift the shadows and by doing so compensate for the unique brightness response of CRT monitors. If we were to plot the output brightness of a CRT monitor and the desired output onto a graph, the result would roughly look like this. And this is what it would look like if we added the transfer function that we need to correct for the CRT monitor's brightness response. The formula used to visualize the CRT curve is simply x by the power of gamma, with x representing the input values stored in the image file. The Greek letter used in the equation explains why so many people refer to transfer functions as gamma. Using a gamma value of 2.2 used to be a common approximation for the brightness response of a CRT monitor. All we need to do to reverse this function is replace the gamma variable with 1 over gamma. This results in the two curves that we've already seen earlier. The top curve is used when storing an image file and the bottom curve is used when displaying it, eventually cancelling each other out. Over the years more and more complex transfer functions were developed. This includes the one used by the sRGB color space, which is still one of the most used color spaces up to this day. While CRT monitors are at the origin of nonlinear transfer functions, there is also another benefit of using them. Our eyes perceive light logarithmically, which simply means that we are better at perceiving small changes in a dark context rather than a bright one. By using a transfer function similar to the one mentioned before, we are allocating more substeps to the dark values, which means we are less likely to notice any stepping. In fact, using a gamma of 2.2 just like we did earlier means that 50% of our substeps are dedicated to the darkest 21.8% of our full brightness range. The graph you can see right now visualizes just how much finer the substeps of dark values are. So far we've only talked about the origin and benefits of using certain transfer functions, but what about the downsides? Both the sRGB and the gamma transfer functions have a nonlinear brightness response. The opposite of this is a linear transfer function. While color spaces that use nonlinear transfer functions are great to efficiently store images, they're not optimal for certain other purposes. For example, if you use textures to store data such as roughness, metallic or normal values, you're aiming to store a specific value. You don't want a transfer function to distort these values as they're being saved. You want the input to be stored exactly as it is. Another example of when you want to use a linear transfer function is when handling any kind of calculation. These calculations include, but are not limited to blurring, compositing, or rendering. You should not use a nonlinear transfer function for any of these operations, or the results will look off. The example you can see right now shows a simple transition from red to green, with only one difference between the top and the bottom half. The top half uses a nonlinear transfer function, while the bottom uses a linear one. Even though the same mathematic operation is applied, the nonlinear transfer function causes the result to look muddy. Let's talk about gamma now that we've established what the transfer function is. Well, we have already mentioned that the gamma defines the range of colors a color space can store. Even if a color is within the color range of two separate gamuts, it would be represented by a different set of RGB values for each of them. To make things easier, I'm going to split the topic gamut into two parts, primaries and white point. To help us visualize everything, we're going to use the CIE chromaticity diagram from 1931 which is still commonly used as a point of reference. The commission that created this diagram collected a lot of data about the standard human observer. And in an abstract way, you could say that they measured the color space of the human eye. The colored section within the diagram represents the visible spectrum of light, and thus the colors which we can perceive. 
Overlaying the color range of other color spaces allows us to easily compare them to the color range of human vision. The gamut of most color spaces is defined by three primary colors, known as primaries. Adding these primaries to the diagram creates a triangle, which represents the full color range covered by the color space. While the primaries define the range of colors, the white point basically manages the white balance of the color space, just like the color temperature does for a photo. All that is required to do this is to store the values representing a neutral white. Sometimes the white point is included in the CAE diagram as a simple dot. Sometimes it's indicated with a W, but quite frequently it isn't even included at all in the graph. The color temperature used in photography links the color of light black body would emit when heated to a certain temperature. This temperature is measured in Kelvin and results in the black body curve. The white point can theoretically be placed anywhere within the gamut of a color space, but since the purpose of the white point is to balance the colors in comparison to the surrounding light, it makes sense to also use the values, which can be found on the black body curve. The most common white points amongst color spaces are called D65 and D60. D65 refers to a color temperature of 6500 Kelvin, and in a similar fashion, D60 refers to 6000 Kelvin. Color spaces of most consumer grade TVs and PC screens use a white point of D65. However, variations of these color spaces exist and will be labeled accordingly. How do we benefit from using proper color management? Color spaces can be optimized for multiple purposes. Just think about the printing example. Depending on the purpose, you might want to prioritize disk space, minimize data loss, or optimize for a certain algorithm. Proper color management allows us to use color spaces based on the purpose which we are currently pursuing. Let's take a look at an example. For CG rendering, the first step is to convert all inputs into the same color space. This color space is known as the working or rendering color space. All rendering calculations are performed within that color space. After rendering, the image has to be converted to the color space of your screen to ensure that it will be displayed correctly. The input conversion is done by the input transform, and the output conversion by the output device transform. IDT originally also stood for input device transform, but this term has been replaced as of ASUS version 1.0. All color space conversions happen on a from source color space to target color space basis. IDTs and ODTs are no exception, and yet they will only let you choose one color space. This is simply because the target of the IDT is always the working or rendering color space, while the same is true for the source of the ODT. Typically ODTs are not actually applied to your data, but instead are used as a temporary LUT to preview what you are working on. For example, if you are creating a texture in linear sRGB, you are using the LUT to preview your textures, but when exporting the texture, the ODT or LUT isn't actually applied to the data itself. It remains in the linear sRGB color space. A rundown of a full color management workflow will follow in another part of the series. To sum it up, proper color management ensures that the color spaces of different inputs and outputs are unified, and calculations can be done with the best color space option available. There's no such thing as the perfect color space, and the working or rendering color space should be chosen depending on the current task, but more about this later. The job of a color pipeline is to help you transition from one task to another, as it manages the conversions for you. OpenColor.io, also known as OCIO, is an open source color pipeline, and it is commonly integrated into software packages such as Maya, Mari, or Nuke. Technically, Nuke and Mari use a slightly modified version, but for the sake of keeping this video short, <laughs> I will not go into more detail. While OpenColor.io is great, the default working or rendering color space isn't really ideal for high quality visual effects work, which is why going forward we will be focusing on the Academy Color Encoding System, or short, ASIS. ASIS is based on OpenColor.io, but it includes many additional color spaces and color space transforms. And while ASUS also isn't perfect, it's nevertheless one of the most advanced systems currently available.